don't often get to say that these days, it still brings a catch to my throat because I miss this country a lot. And one of the things about living in Australia, unfortunately, is that Indigenous culture gets nowhere near the recognition that it does here. And that is something that pains me, living in Australia. However, I am still a New Zealander and um, proud of it. Uh, so it is a real pleasure to be home again. Um, but right up front, I'll be very clear about where I am here. Most of New Zealand's private firearms will never kill or injure a human. Only a tiny proportion of gun owners will ever criminally misuse a weapon. New Zealand and Australia abound with very good reasons for gun ownership, from pest control to animal welfare. As frontier nations, we've always taken pride in gun safety. We have a thriving, middle-winning uh, shooting sports community, and we're rightly proud of our sensible attitudes to firearms and to our record of gun safety. I've just recently come back from Mogadishu, uh, setting up a firearm registry for the, Mogadish, for the Somali police. And if there was ever a problem, a country with a problem with guns, it is Somalia. In many ways, it was ludicrous to start out on gun control in New Zealand. It's a country that barely needs it. And so, um, it's, it, no, it really is a pleasure to be here. But I'm not going to say things that please everybody. We also have a small minority who relentlessly describe themselves as law-abiding shooters and then threaten mass, mass disobedience when a law comes along that they can't abide. This is the tiny pro uh, proportion of shooters with extreme views who pretend to represent all gun owners. They wield power out of all proportion to their numbers, and we call them the gun lobby. For decades, New Zealand allowed its gun lobby to dictate public policy on firearms. Almost inevitably, there came a tragedy which showed how foolish that was. Unfortunately, it was a huge tragedy. In the immediate aftermath of the Christchurch mosque shootings, this government quickly banned, bought back, and destroyed the weapon of choice for mass killers. And now, almost a, year, uh, a year's delay, after almost a year's delay, you have fresh legislation in the House which will test this country once again. But can a minority of shooters succeed in watering down this new law, as they did on every previous occasion? I'm sure they'll try hard, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if they succeed to a considerable degree. There will be disappointment coming next week. I'm sure of it. The degree of it is all that we need to be concerned about. So gun control generates levels of fury and mutual intolerance of other people's views right up there with immigration and abortion. It spotlights some of the deepest ideological schisms and racial fears of our time. Those extremes are, of course, most visible in, Australia, in America. The reason that gun control in almost every country in the world differs from the unique exceptionalism of the United States is very simple. More than a century ago, the dominant European and Asian empires became so fearful of revolution and armed violence that they enacted remarkably similar gun control laws. In London, three policemen and a Latvian revolutionary died in the Sydney Street siege of 1911. That's Home Secretary Winston Churchill wearing a top hat, having his picture taken at the scene of the shooting. British police, routinely unarmed even to this day, had to summon the Scots guards to bring guns to the gunfight. And there's Churchill again. And so it was that in the early 1900s, the great empires invoked public shootings as a reason for all to agree on three central pillars of civilian gun control. The person. Almost all countries, including New Zealand, but excluding the United States, prohibit gun ownership without a license. The object. Until this month, New Zealanders were almost alone with Americans in stubbornly refusing to maintain a crucial, globally recognized pillar of gun control, and that is register all firearms. And then there's the mythical right to own a gun, 
While most of the world considers the use of a firearm, just like the use of a car, to be a conditional privilege subject to safety and good behaviour, America remains the only country on earth whose constitution confers a broad right to own and carry guns. There are other countries with similar provisions in their constitutions, Mexico, El Salvador, but those are completely overridden by statute law which denies the free and unfettered right to firearms. So because in those days the global empires were just that, these three staples of injury prevention were copied into the laws of about 150 colonies around the globe. Everywhere but America, it's these interdependent precautions acting closely together which enable most governments to keep a handle on the misuse of firearms. But in 1983, unlike almost every similar country, New Zealand abandoned that second provision. For the past 37 years, this country has not registered around 97% of its firearms. Ten years on, after a licensed gun owner killed 13 men, women and children at Aramoana, the government did try to restrict military-style semi-automatic weapons, commonly known as assault rifles. But the Arms Amendment Act of 1992 was soon crippled by loopholes inserted by the shooter's lobby, and it did very little to solve the problem. That's when I made the mistake of launching this country's first national gun control group. I say mistake because I had no idea what I was up against. Gunsafe New Zealand, in which I was joined by Gary McCormick and Graham East and others, was suddenly the focus of frantic attack. I remember one newsletter from the gun press which said, now we know who the enemy is, it's Alpers, let's get him. And because I had a certain degree of notoriety at the time, I was the number one target. Gary copped it as well, but we were threatened, our employers were threatened, and we faced all manner of dirty tricks. For a short time, I tried to get home before the kids returned from school to make sure there weren't any more feces in the mailbox. These men wanted us to know that they hated us, and of course, that they had guns. But this was exactly what fortified us, and it's the ferocity of those men which guaranteed that we'd spend all these years beating back the bullies. I would quite happily have bowed out after setting that initial group up, allowed other people to take, take the baton, but nobody did, and for clear reasons. Uh, I was being very heavily intimidated, and nobody else wanted the same thing to happen to them. Now, sadly, the changes we advocated a quarter of a century ago, and this is a really sad part, they are the measures you're enacting today. These gun controls, including the registration of all firearms, were specifically intended to prevent angry gun owners like the Christchurch killer from so easily obtaining a mini arsenal of murder weapons. As a nation, we failed those victims. Meanwhile, over the same 26 years, the engine that propelled gun control in a, into a different era was the public health model of injury prevention, and that's why I'm here with the School of Public Health. For many decades, injury by gunshot was seen almost exclusively as a crime problem. Most of the proposed solutions fell into the bottom of the cliff variety, after the fact, law enforcement and retribution. But to public health practitioners, the gun is to gun violence as the mosquito is to malaria. Bullets and firearms are the agents of harm, and both are amenable to standard injury prevention procedures. Instead of waiting until after the damage was done, advanced societies developed a range of well-proven harm prevention measures, just as they did for the toll of automobile injury, tobacco-related disease, HIV, AIDS, smallpox, and many others. So what could New Zealand expect to see if its gun laws were brought up to international standards? Let's look across the Tasman. If holistic best practice firearm injury prevention has been entrenched anywhere, it's in Australia. 22 years ago, that country had a serious problem, and it wasn't just a single gun massacre. In 10 years, the country had seen 11 mass shootings in which 116 people died. Most of the victims were killed with a semi-automatic rifle, and two-thirds of the killers were licensed gun owners firing legally held firearms. And it still surprises some to hear that 87% of those killers had no history of violent crime, and two-thirds had no history of mental illness. 
Finally, on the 28th of April 1996, in the Broad Arrow Cafe at Port Arthur, Tasmania, a lone pathetic social misfit, those were the words the judge used at his sentencing, killed 35 innocent people. The first 29 bullets from this young man's AR-15 rifle ended the lives of 20 innocents in just 90 seconds. In Australia, the Port Arthur massacre was both the country's tipping point and its awakening. This cartoon is typical of the swing in public opinion. In some ways, it was vicious. National transformation of gun laws happened very, very quickly. Newly elected Prime Minister John Howard was the country's most conservative leader in decades. Yet in his first major act of leadership, and by far his most popular in his entire political career, Howard took only 12 days to bring together the four major political parties to radically improve gun laws across all eight states and territories. John Howard's mantra, then and ever since, was that Australia should never go down the American path with guns. That made him really unpopular in the States when he went over and kept doing uh, right-wing lectures there. He recounts how he would talk about almost every subject, come to gun control, and the room went dead. I mean, George W. Bush used to call him his sheriff in this part of the world. He was not uh, a left-wing pinko, and yet, and he went against his rump support to do this, he and Tim Fisher. But they did something of tremendous courage. As New Zealand did last year, Australia targeted the most conspicuous agent of harm, that is, semi-automatic long guns. For years, arms dealers had marketed these as assault weapons. Predictably, they became the weapon of choice for mass killers. Back then in Australia and New Zealand, the gun lobby was a powerful force. The sporting shooters associations of both countries admitted taking money and advice from the National Rifle Association of America. They dominated advice to government and they ran energetic disinformation machines. I was a member of the NRA for the best part of a decade. How else do you find out what they'll do next? And it was extraordinary, sitting in the United States, reading all the NRA uh, literature, watching all their videos, their, uh, their infomercials on cable TV, and watching as each idea was taken up in New Zealand or Australia within weeks or months. And there are people here who regard the NRA as their heroes, and there are people here who uh, yes, that's, it's, it, it's just so very sad to see. So, the, every key NRA theme and strategy was quickly adopted here. It's doubtful that our gun lobbies still receive funding from the US, but if they do, they're wise enough to deny it. Meanwhile, some Australian gun owners were also threatening violence. As one, at one rural meeting when John Howard defended his gun ban, for the first time in Australia, a Prime Minister was photographed wearing a bulletproof vest. In the following years, Australia destroyed well over a million guns, or nearly a third of the country's civilian firearms. And the cost? A one-year Medicare levy of 0.2%, collected about $15 from each taxpayer. To add perspective, a similar effort in the United States would require the destruction of 90 million firearms. It ain't gonna happen. So in terms of public health and safety, what was the result? Well, measured against the original targets, here's what followed. As in New Zealand, the first priority declared by government was to reduce the risk of mass shootings. The second much broader target was to reduce the much more common overall risk of gun death and injury. 22, and the results, 22 years without a public mass shooting. Sadly for Australia, that drought was broken when in 2018 a licensed gun owner, a farmer in Western Australia, killed his family of five and then himself. That number of victims just meets the threshold for a mass shooting. So, since the post-Port post Arthur gun laws, overall, the risk of dying by gunshot in Australia has more than halved and has not gone up again in those, all of those years. And there's been no substitution of method. Murderers did not switch to other weapons. Australia's rate of gun homicide per 100,000 people is now 25 times lower than the United States. 
But it wasn't just gun homicides, and this is something none of us expected. In Australia, 77, well, we know that 77% of gun deaths have nothing to do with crime. Instead, they're suicides. Much, a very similar ratio applies here in New Zealand. One peer-reviewed study found that the country's gun buybacks also led to a drop in gun suicide rates of almost 80%. Although today's politicians and journalists almost always cite one simple contrast, 11 mass shootings in the decade before gun, gun law reform and zero mass shootings in the two decades after, no one suggests that Australia's gun problems are over. Granted, a million firearms were destroyed. But in the two decades which followed the massacre in Tasmania, Australian arms dealers imported and sold more than a million new firearms. When gun owners were forced to sell their banned semi-automatic rifles and shotguns to the government, many used the cash to buy a replacement single-shot firearm. That's the spike on the left, showing a large increase in gun dealer imports. You can expect the same to happen here in New Zealand. By mid-2015, Australians once again owned as many guns in total as they had before Port Arthur. But when you factor in the population increase over that time, Australia now has 23% fewer firearms per capita, per head of population. So don't expect New Zealand's recent gun law changes to greatly reduce the number of guns. You'll notice that shooters are often keen to introduce children to firearms at a young age. They work hard to get guns into schools and many government grants to gun clubs succeed under the guise of child safety. This despite reams of research pouring doubt on firearm education as a method of saving lives. Studies do show that practical safety measures such as child-proof lids prevent poisoning, and yet there's no requirement for a firearm to be baby-proof. And getting kids into guns? Well, to shooters, that's a matter of survival. The most reliable indicator of firearm ownership is that your father had guns. Sport shooting is a cherished cultural tradition and it's been under threat since people moved to the cities. According to all the polls that asked the question, in the past 30 years, the proportion of Australian households with one or more firearms fell by 75%. How can this be? It's because the people who bought more firearms were the same people who already had firearms. Those who own guns are buying more, while those who own no guns are becoming more numerous. This trend is international. Americans also report a steady decline in household gun ownership over the past 30 to 40 years. And that trend is even more pronounced in some Pacific Island nations. Just to the north of Australia in Papua New Guinea, disputes once settled with bows and arrows can now be fought with assault rifles. Because of this, a broad consensus has emerged in our region. Destroying firearms can lead to fewer gun deaths. And they do it with glee, amid overwhelming public support. More guns were destroyed in the Solomon Islands than the country even knew it had. By law, this is now a gun-free nation. Timor-Leste did much the same, and those two countries are not alone. In three quarters of the nations in our region, police patrol unarmed. Five countries and territories ban private possession of firearms. 11 of 20 Pacific countries and territories have no military, and the Pacific has the world's highest per capita rate of firearm destruction. Remarkably, what I'm calling the Pacific Consensus for Disarmament emerged without any coordination. The region almost unconsciously forged a new way. Island nations have both resolved in law and been actively encouraged to disarm the neighborhood. Of course, this cannot work for everyone. Despite this boy's choice of a necklace, the Pacific Islands haven't been a major local conflict, or haven't seen a major local conflict, since the nine-year Bougainville War. The Pacific is not infested with AK-47s or M16s. The world's major illicit drug and arms trafficking routes bypass our region, and gang violence is not endemic. But we have reversed a popular American slogan. For the time being, at least, our regional bumper sticker reads, an unarmed society is a polite society. Now, I can't overemphasize the importance of this. New Zealand is one of the very few countries left in the world which has the luxury of prevention.
Prevention, of course, being the main focus of almost, public, almost all public health initiatives. And we have the opportunity, especially in the Pacific, to make sure that it doesn't get a lot worse a lot faster. Some of it's an accident purely of calibre, that uh, the great majority of firearms uh, used in crime in Australia and New Zealand are of NATO calibre, especially in places like, um, uh, like Papua New Guinea. And so if you bring an AK-47 into a genuine or a, a variant of an AK, you can't get the genuine thing anymore, um, you are firing ammunition that is not common in this part of the world, Eastern Bloc ammunition. And that for many Pacific Island nations, although it wasn't hard for New Zealand gun dealers to import it and, and buy millions of rounds of it, um, the, for the Pacific, that is tremendously significant. But now, here's a, <coughs> a depressing thought, <coughs> and here I show my age, from 1968. I remember this famous time cover. I, at that stage, I had nothing to do with gun control. But 50 years ago, America, I was more interested in uh, Roy Lichtenstein. Uh, 50 years ago, Americans were already saying many of the things which have brought you here today. And how naive were we foreigners to imagine that Columbine High might be their national tipping point. I was in working, working on gun control in the United States when that happened. Or for that matter, Virginia Tech, or Sandy Hook, Orlando, Stoneman Douglas, Pittsburgh, the list goes on. But here's the thing, Americans in particular have already invented, tested, and proved most of the solutions we need to control this epidemic. On their roads, they deployed a holistic array of evidence-based public health measures to dramatically reverse the toll of death and injury by automobile. The world followed suit, and we'll always be grateful for America's example. Public health researchers helped design safer cars, safer roads, drink driving laws, traffic calming, but also the three pillars of automobile control. The person license all drivers. The object register all vehicles. The right defined in legislation as a conditional privilege. You'll notice that licensing and registration of vehicles has not led to mass confiscation. As with a firearm, there's no right to drive a car. Abuse the privilege of motorized mobility and you can lose your license. But despite all the life-saving precautions on our roads, cars remain unchanged as symbols of masculinity, power, and freedom. There is no research to suggest that registration leads to emasculation. Similar public health safety campaigns from tobacco harm reduction to HIV AIDS, not to mention smallpox, malaria, Ebola, saved countless millions of lives. In each case, our public health and legal communities overcame decades of denial from cashed up self-interest groups. With HIV AIDS, America even set aside religious mythology just as potent as the God-given right to own guns. But realistically, the gun lobby tell us that registration of all guns in New Zealand is just too big a job, right? Oh, please. The entire European community registers every cow. India has a population of 1.4 billion, and yet 80% of households in India register the LPG bottles that they rely on for cooking. We know how to do these things. A couple of weeks ago, I installed a new firearm registry at National Police Headquarters in Mogadishu. If anyone, as I said, has real problems with guns, it's Somalia. And yet, by the end of this year, our firearm registry software will be installed in police, customs, and military bases in Samoa, Fiji, Vanuatu, Liberia, and Nigeria. It's not that difficult. And if those countries can do it, surely so can New Zealand. It may take even more decades for some to accept this, but eventually, because we know it saves lives, holistic, public health-driven, evidence-based gun control is inevitable. Thank you, and good luck.